Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Hunter Ohanian. I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and we're very happy to have all of you here. Um, this is a series of Zoom interviews that we started uh, probably about a month into the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're very pleased this evening to have Paul Lasicki here. Paul, hello. How are you? Hey, Hunter. I'm so happy to be here. Nice to see you. Nice you too. to see you. So Paul and I know each other uh, from Provincetown, which of course a lot of what his new book um, a later is, is about. I mean, it really is sort of a, an amazing homage to Pro Provincetown, but also uh, I know Paul from here as well because his parents live two buildings away from where I live here in Pompano Beach. And so it's really nice to spend some time with, with Paul. Uh, so um, just to tell those of you who are new to Stonewall, um, we are located in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we are, um, we have, well, from the library, we have 28,000 books. It's believed to be the largest LGBTQ library in the world. And in our archives, we have um, uh, 2,700 linear feet uh, over 6 million pages of documents, mostly from the last quarter of the 20th century to the pre present day in our archive. And then in addition, we have tours and we have exhibitions that go throughout the United States. Uh, and we have e exhibitions here in Fort Lauderdale as well too. And so if you come down here, please stop by and see us. If you're from some other part of the US or the world, um, visit us at stonewall-museum.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. I promise we won't ask you for money. Well, maybe just a tad, but not too, too much money. And, um, but you'll get to see um, the, all of the events that we're having in this series. Uh, we've been doing these once a week uh, since the pandemic started. And uh, it's also nice to sort of think about where we are. I think today is July 29th, uh, 2020. And just to put a date stamp this, and we're probably in our fourth month of a United States worldwide pandemic. Uh, we have probably in the US over 160,000 people have died. Um, the Congress of the United States has allocated over $2 trillion to help people. Seems we're at the tail end of that support. And even though we might be at the tail end of that, there's still many, many communities in the United States which are suffering and they have not found a way out. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we're seeing probably some of the most profound civil rights demonstrations in the United States. Uh, for the first time in many years of my lifetime, we're seeing people really challenging systemic racism from bottom to top in our society. And it is actually really very um, interesting and very, uh, very heartening to see all of this dialogue that's going on right now. So for those of you 20 years from now, 30 years from now watching it and understanding what it is that we're doing at this particular point, I kind of think of these talks as being like something through Star Trek up in the sky or something through, you know, um, some other science fiction movie because these will last for, forever. Uh, but just know these are real times that we're actually going through. Um, uh, the Stonewall National Museum and Archives is a queer museum and library, as I said, and many people who we have in this series are people who have actually dealt with HIV and AIDS, and so they are in their current lifetimes very familiar with what that pandemic meant to them personally. Uh, whether they were infected or not makes no di difference. It actually infected who they were as individuals. And uh, we're all watching this kind of stuff ha happening at the same time. Um, one last thing I want to say is that Paul and I uh, will be doing a little bit of chatting here in the beginning. And then uh, Paul's going to do some readings from his new book called Later. And, uh, and then we're going to leave the last 15 minutes for questions from you. So fill your questions into um, the chat portion. And there's also a Q&A portion. Load your questions in there. 
uh, feel free to to ask them at any time that they could come up and we'll try to filter th through them and get through everybody's quick questions. So um, thank you all for uh, all of your participation. So Paul, where are we finding you tonight? Where are you? I'm, I'm home in Brooklyn in my apartment. And um, how's it going? It's fine. It's pretty much, you know, where I've been since mid-March. I think, you know, the last time I left the city for work, because I work outside of the city down near Philadelphia, was, I think it was March 10th. But um, I've been largely here, a few trips in, to Manhattan. I went to Provincetown for about five days earlier this month. And, um, you know, it's great to go back, but I, I felt so hyper vigilant about getting there and coming back that, you know, it was honestly, I was happy to get away, but it felt more arduous than I expected. I think it's different you yeah. know, to travel, obviously, in a car than it is to, yeah. and particularly to hop on Amtrak. A short trip to be able to do that stuff and have to worry about it all right now. It's right. a huge problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I feel ready to do it again. I mean, our counts in the Northeast are so much different from where you are in Florida and for those in the Southwest. And, um, you know, things were quite bad here. I think most of you know this back in, back in March and April where, the, you know, 23,000 people died here. I'm still wondering like what it means to live in a place where 23,000 people died within just a few miles radius of where I live within a matter of four months. So yeah, it um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's an odd time of, I mean, it almost, I just walked around the neighborhood and it almost feels like another version of everyday life is taking place. People are eating outside and, you know, everyone, most everyone has a mask on and um, yeah, but I think we're all scared that, you know, this just might be a brief period and it's, a, I, I don't think that the virus can be held back geographically as much as we might try to make that happen. I remember at the beginning of this uh, sort of, of the er early first stage, there was discussion about uh, about a vaccine. I thought, oh my God, I, I couldn't even think about that because it just seemed um, inconceivable. But you know, we we heard uh, it's very difficult to trust certain things now. But we heard just last week that the United States government was going to be spending two billion dollars. Uh, to perfect a vaccine by the end of 2020. Um, this will or will not be true. Uh, there's great distrust in the current government mm -hmm. right now. Um, but as I say these words, I sort of say them matter of factly in all this, it does feel like we're living in a science fiction movie right, right. right. It, feels, it feels so surreal. I try to be very objective when I present this stuff to say these are the facts and uh, everything, I, it, this is all politics aside, you can all imagine what my politics are, but all politics aside, these are the facts of what we live in in this day, that the idea that the government will spend two billion dollars to put a back, to try to put a vaccine in place that will allow life to go back to normal. Yeah, I, and, and for whom? Like, how will this be dispensed and distributed within a short period of time? I mean, talk about a, a dystopian novel. I mean, that dis dispensation or whatever word it is just does not happen overnight. And, 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 and that's a really good point because, of course, what we've seen so far is that women, um, uh, non-typical body conforming people, uh, people of color, uh, people with less social uh, economic status have been the ones who have been affected the most mm -hmm. by the virus uh, that's been going on. Again, with a dystopian uh, view toward this. Um, I just, I looked up the figures in New York today and it, um, 
69% of the people who have died in New York City have been Hispanic, Black, or Asian. Anyway, we're going to depress ourselves. I try to lay all this stuff out to try to understand that for those of you watching this 20, 30 years from now, you understand what at the period of time that we're doing this. But so let me read a little bit of you about Paul, and then we will go into uh, his newest book. So um, uh, Paul is the author of six books, including later, which we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, The Narrow Door, Unbuilt Projects, The Burning House, Famous Builder, and my personal favorite book of Paul's, Lawn Boy. Uh, if you've not seen Lawn Boy or if you've not re read it, uh, buy a copy from your local independent bookstore. Uh, uh, but it is really very good. Um, and it's my fave. Uh, his work has appeared in The Atlantic, BuzzFeed, Conjectures, The Cut, Fence, New York Times, Plowshares, Tin House, as well as many other uh, magazines. Paul has won an award from the Guggenheim Foundation. He has won something from the NEA. Let me pause there for a minute. How did you win something from the NEA? You're too young to be free Jesse Helms to the <laughs> NEA for <grant. laughs> um, I I won that award in grad school. I mean, the Guggenheim is fairly recent. But yeah, that's a whole story in itself. <laughs> and Paul has also done many residency pr programs. And of course, he was a resident at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, which many of you, I can see, are, are connected to Provincetown. Um, I've been connected with Pro Provincetown and the Fine Arts Work Center for many years. And so uh, we're, we're happy to be speaking about that tonight. Paul actually serves on the writing co committee um, of the Fine Arts Work Center, which is the group that actually makes the selections uh, for, um, or they read all the manuscripts for next year's writing fellows. Uh, it's a whole different story about what's going on there. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about the Work Center. And so um, right now you're teaching at uh, Rutgers, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in the MFA pr program. Yes, though I'm on sabbatical this fall, so, it's, you know, it feels present and it feels super distant at the same time. I mean, uh, the pandemic actually came down right in the middle of the semester. And I guess, you know, I mentioned March 10th and halfway through that class, my grad students, one of my grad students got um, a text message that said Rutgers, you know, will go remote from now till I don't know what language was used, but we looked at each other, you know, at this community we'd taken care to build since January. And I said, man, we might not be able to see each other again. And this is, this might, this might be it. So I, I remember taking a picture and we were kind of awestruck and bewildered and a little melancholy. And we all said goodbye, like not knowing what to expect. And then, we had spring break and we came back and we did Zoom for the rest of the semester. And um, it, it was just a different kind of pedagogy from that point out. And we already had, you know, a, we'd already built a community, but um, yeah, I think the things we talked about were different um, at that point particularly heightened moment. Most of my students immediately started writing about isolation and estrangement and quite literally straightforwardly about the pandemic. And that, that work was exciting to see because it really seemed to come from a, a position of necessity. People weren't, you know, trying to, to sound or, you know, people were just writing the work they needed to write. They, it, you know, to sound clever, to sound new or like an antidote to all the sentimentality in the air. None of that stuff mattered. So. And of course, you know, to be able to be, to be writing about sort of this shocking unknown period that we were in at that time is really very powerful. And, and I, I, I do think, um, uh, I wish two things. I wish that uh, 
there'll be some other side of this pandemic, uh, but then also I wish that there will be a whole body of work that will come out of it that we'll be able to look at for several decades as a result. Yeah. And just as a maker myself, I would just remind everybody, you don't have to put that stuff out there right now. You have to think the thoughts, you have to write down your notes, you have to write down your feelings, but you don't have to make it now because we don't actually know what's going on right now. And so we don't, even if we don't know the science, we don't actually know what's happening to us right now. Yeah. So just yeah. hang on. It, it seems, I was just thinking earlier, it seems impossible to write from this point out of anything like a coherent experience because it feels like our reality back in March is entirely different from our reality maybe last month. And I, you know, in some like psychologically, it feels like we've lived through already several, several different experiences of the pandemic it's like we've just we've lived years in the last four months yeah and again just one last thing to say is that you know it's very possible that this fall we're going to see some other period of this and so people just better get ready but anyway paul let's talk about later um so you were a fellow at the fine arts work center what year 91 91, and then I was there for the, a subsequent year, but I arrived in October 1991. And so what were you doing before you were a fellow at the Work Center? Um, the year before, I was in grad school at the University of Iowa, and then before that, I was in grad school at Rutgers, but I had won an NEA, as you, you know, mentioned before, and I had a year to write, which is every writer's gift, and I felt, and I ended up staying with, at my parents' then house on the west coast of Florida, and I felt really estranged and isolated. Perhaps there was a come down from, you know, all the, all the stimulation from grad school. So at the point I came to Provincetown, I was really hungering for a sense of community. I, um, just wanted to belong. I wanted to be, I wanted, I really wanted to be with my tribe. I wanted to have sex. I wanted to, um, you know, the thing that was amazing about Provincetown is that you know, there were like three threads of life that were really important to me. One, a queer community, two, an arts community that was developed and had a history. And it, well, abutted the natural world, this like wilderness that felt strange and mysterious and uncharted. So like there are very few places where all, all of the poles line up. So I had, Provincetown had always been, a, you know, a mythical place to me. And I came to that place with incredible joy and hope even though, you know, it was, it was a hard town to read at that time. I came in the midst of a pandemic in which there were often three or four funerals a week. And, you know, I, I'd become someone's friend and that person, just casually, and that person might, might die the following week. So it was a time in which, um, I was like coming into being simultaneously in a community where ongoing this couldn't be guaranteed. Everything felt super provisional. Yeah, so tenuous. And just to just to sort of uh, put this in the context for those of you who are not familiar with Provincetown, of course, it's at the very end of Cape Cod. It has over 125 years of being an artist and writer's community. Um, and, um, as Paul mentioned, as far as the natural resources in the town, the very tiny part of the town there at the very tip of Cape Cod, 90% of the landmass is owned by the US government. It is a national park. Only 10% of the landmass is owned by private individuals. So you are truly out in the middle of the ocean surrounded by nature. and. Mm -hmm. That is a very amazing thing. And the Work Center was founded in 1968. 
um, to bring artists and writers there. Uh, Paul, had you been to Provincetown before you applied for the Work Center? Um, yes, um, back in the early 80s with my mom and my brother. My brother went to school in Boston at New England Conservatory and I drove up with my mom. And so the three of us took a little road trip to Provincetown and I think my mother saw how enthralled I was with the place and it was how old unsettling. Were you? How, old, how old were you during that trip? Oh, like early 20s? Yeah. So yeah. She, so she, my she eyes were wide open. And the street and everything. So. Yeah. 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 And, you um, know, my mom had gone to Provincetown with her, you know, her brother and her best friend sometime in the 50s and she talked about it that visit for years and years that it was kind of a mythical story in our family history yeah oh it's so nice actually for it to have played that mythical role and then you actually had this very legitimate storied experience with the place right at the time that you applied in 1991 to become a fellow there you know, there were 10 writing fellows, uh, probably eight of them were new fellows, and there could have been 500, 700 applications that yours were selected from. Probably at that time, Roger Skillings, uh, who we all love, of course, uh, was the director and the head of the writing pr program. But let's get into the book, and um, I asked you to, to look at a few things. Yeah. But, you know, like, um, if you have something early on to read about your time in Provincetown. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, let's, let, let's hear some of the, the book. Yeah, I love the fact that your suggestions are suggestions that I've never read, you know, during the previous 20 events I've done. I usually tend to read like the more narrative sections and I love the fact that you picked the more meaty, essayistic, um, <laughs> meditative section. So. Thank you. Happy to help. <laughs> no, it's just, it's an adventure for me. So this particular set, so I mean, there is a narrative line in the book. I arrive in town, become part of the community of the work center, become part of the community in town. And, um, you know, in part, it's like my personal story of, you know, learning. It's a, it's my sentimental education. It's a story of falling in love, learning to love, and then kind of breaking up. Um, and, uh, but it's also a story of a town and how its inhabitants kept one another lifted during that time of emergency. So um, this is just an attempt of me reading the town and being hyper vigilant. I felt like a deer, you know, I was noticing everything because it was a time and place where you know, it was just before we had the internet. You couldn't, you know, type into to, to Google and ask a question about Provincetown or ask Siri. You had to you had to look. And this community at that time was incredibly DIY. It didn't resemble so much the outside world. So, you know, customs were really particular to the place. I found that super thrilling. So this is a section called um, Three Way. I have never been around so many queers in one place before. Some would use that as a reason to stay single. Why tether yourself to one person when you could spend successive nights with him and him and him and him? I, however, respond to this plethora of men the way I do when looking at the menu of a Greek diner. I point to the veggie burger, slam the menu shut, and push it across the table so I won't be psychically overloaded. Which is another way of saying, I want a boyfriend. I'm well aware that one of the reasons I want a boyfriend is to signify to others, particularly through the catwalk, that is the main street of town that I'm lovable. A boyfriend is as much a public pact as a private one. And somehow I have gotten the notion that I need to be with someone else in order to be happy. It didn't, it didn't start in town, but someplace earlier when relationships were presumed to be a duty of growing up, 
like buying insurance or a first car. Maybe this comes from growing up near Philadelphia, where single people are usually looked at with caution and concern, and family life is all. So what stance to take on? Or do we not choose our stance, and it is written in our childhoods or in our DNA long before we're in the world? Is a boyfriend someone to love or someone to be loved by? All couples, straight or queer, position themselves along that fault line. Though they rarely talk about it, I know how to do the first, but the second part makes me nervous, like an amateur. It silences me, actually. Dogs know how to be loved, but they are rare like that. For humans, it's easier to turn one's eyes to someone else than it is to bear another's eyes on you. Those eyes come with expectation, wanting. Those eyes say, you might leave, so I will grasp onto you and do everything I can to make you feel. As for the possibility of illness being the third party in a relationship, well, imagine waking up one day with new sores on your back, tongue creamy with thrush. You can't even see your way to the bathroom. Your throat hurts. You've been feeling like your old self for weeks, staying up late. None of that dizziness when you get up from the chair. And now you're about to be in a bad patch, which might just be your final stretch. It's a big enough job to take care of yourself. It's already 10 full-time jobs. How could you bear to catch the pain in your boyfriend's eyes? his desire to make things better, fuck better. You say aloud one day just to test him, just to hear how it sounds in the air, and he weeps and stomps and tears a painting off the wall, all the while apologizing for his, apologizing for his outburst. You want to tell him to go, but he's too lost in you to go. His obligation murder, too much to go wrong, too many feelings to be hurt, and the immune system Stress of any kind suppresses it. So the two of you tend politeness the way you tend the garden outside the window. The roses thrive. There's no scale or blight on the leaves. But your relationship, it doesn't die, though you never asked for a three-way with an illness. Well, well, that is, that's an amazing piece. Let's just stop there for a moment. Sure. Um, so tell us about that piece. Tell you about that piece. That's a hard one. It's funny, like, as soon as you write a piece like that and like live with it in your head, it just becomes, it becomes a constellation of sound. And I mean, I'm interested in the structure of it in that, um, you know, it moves through three different parts. I've never been around so many queers before. Um, you know, I have a lot of opportunity here, sexual opportunity, but I really want to, to have a boyfriend because that's part of the sociology. That's part of the culture in which I grew up and that's where validation comes from. But, you know, the speaker doesn't stop there. I start asking, you know, um, you know, what happens to a relationship when one of the two members has HIV? How does that complicate a pact with futurity? You know, how does, how does that, how did that relationship at that time both take so much work and how did it feel like to push back that sense of doom? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It really was, and truly, that was at that time. That was somebody else in the room with the two, two of you. Yeah, yeah, making a third party, like someone stand, like you know, the two of you made someone else together, and it was largely, you know, about futurity, about whether you would have a life together. I mean, my memory of those times is that a lot of couples seemed to stay together because it was presumed that one of the two people would die and um, you had a responsibility to be loyal to one another, you know, through the end. I mean, 
the notion of seeing someone through to the end really carved its way into my psyche for so many years. And I think it carved its way in terms of how I've thought about all relationships since. I mean, I know that it's like something I question. It's something I interrogate. I realize, you know, when I'm involved with someone, I bring a lot of that stuff in the background to even a casual like two day encounter. Like this, that stuff doesn't go away. I wanted to write a book that just laid out the fact that, you know, for many generations of us, not just people my age or your age, but people, you know, even in their thirties, this stuff is there, it's stuff we contend with. And it hasn't been represented for the most part. And what's really interesting too, as you say about, you know, our, our respective ages, what I've come to learn over the last 10 or 15 years is that there are people who are 20 or 30 years younger than us who are not challenged by HIV and AIDS in the same way that we might have been in a very direct way, but they're challenged by it to the extent that it affects their tribe. And it's been very interesting to watch them. And it's our jobs as village elders to try to help them through that process to the extent that we can. But it's yeah. been very interesting to watch them try to survive in a post-world, a post-AIDS world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's so well said. And, you know, we've gone through so many different phases of treatment. Um, you know, since 1995 and 96 and, you know, all the way up through PrEP. And I'm not even talking about the HIV positive side. So, um, yeah, all of that, all of that saturates our identities and how we think of, how we think of what it means to be attached to someone or not. Yes, uh, very true, and 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 also the per permanence and and the future of of that relationship, and then also what our commitment is to it as well. Mm -hmm. Too, just remind everybody, I'm Hunter Ohanian from the Stonewall National Museum and Archive. Uh, we have about half an hour left. I'm here with my uh, good friend Paula Sicky, and we're talking about later and. Uh, we will uh, load your questions up if you have them in the chat function or also in the Q&A function. And this uh, broadcast, this, uh, this Zoom broadcast is being recorded and will be posted on our website so you can share it with your friends or you can watch uh, it later. So Paul, I, I know I gave you a few suggestions because I, I re read your book and I gave it to several pit people, particularly Provincetown pit people after I, I got it. Um, but so of the suggestions I gave you, let's move on to the next one. Which one uh, did you find it interesting? Yeah, oh, this one is a little more playful, but I think it's playful on the surface, but you know, so much of this book is like reading the taxonomy of a place, like reading the categories of a culture that has, you know, heretofore not been known to, to one. So this is about a page long and it's called New Boy. New Boy. Every season, there will be a new boy. I've been told by a few acquaintances to keep an eye out for this phenomenon. He'll be absurdly handsome with wavy dark hair and rugged features that set him apart from the prevalent look of white Boston. He'll have some mystery about him a distinctive name, a movie star name, likely self-chosen the week before he got to town. He'll often be within five years of 27 and will possess one feature of exaggerated musculature, say triceps as wide as his neck or heartbreaking lats. One year his name will be Storm, another year Echo, once that boy becomes famous in town his name will come up at every party every public event. To claim connection to the new boy will be to confer prestige and value upon oneself. Have you seen Echo? Echo is looking for a new apartment. You have to see Echo's old apartment. Where? Oh, Echo was at the A&P. Well, the next time you see Storm, tell him Echo got a new haircut. Oh, what kind of haircut? 
Caesar haircut, oh my God, echoes always so much ahead of the curve. Will the new boy enjoy his status? All those faces turn to him when he might once have been bullied or ignored. Of course he will enjoy the attention, but he will also feel the clock in his bones. If he knows his time is now, he will be smart enough to know someone else could sweep into town and take his designation away. Invariably, he will have one season. Invariably, he will be trailed by that one season for the rest of his life, if he has a long life. Years later, someone will point to him, now a nice middle-aged man, and say, see that guy? He was once the handsomest guy in town. And that statement will be delivered in a voice part sympathetic, part respectful, part laced with schadenfreude. And that man, should he hear that voice, will look forward and pull in his lips, carry himself as if those words had always been about someone else. So when I read that piece, I thought about something when I was much younger, and I thought about um, the idea that there was a cliche out there in the gay community that we would all be attractive for at least one week. <laughs> Especially in Provincetown. I, mean, I was told this right away. That's that boy season. And, you know, I was interested in that perspective, but kind of wary about it because I always liked older guys anyway. So to be told that someone had an immediate shelf life was a bit of, I just thought like, eh, I don't buy that. <laughs> but of course, we, we live up and we, we, we've lived, we've grown up and lived in a culture which is so uh, body centric. And even if we don't care about it, um, we are always flattered by it. If we happen to have that moment of shininess that um, brings us through the gay c community. Right. Yeah, and I, you know, honestly, what's unspoken behind that was that I probably, I was the new boy probably for a couple weeks in Provincetown, but did not have the self-esteem or distance to know that I could possibly play that role or be attractive to people. You know, it just, I was so wrapped up in my own dramas of, you know, desire. And <laughs> well, but you know, but you know, it's like you said, you were just you were in Provincetown recently. You told me that earlier off ca camera, but um, you know, it is 30 years later, you can always show up, and now you can show up as your 30 minutes of being a daddy. In Provincetown. Yeah, well, exactly. And now, you know, it's funny back then, it was a town of the young. I mean, gay men did not live, you were, you were an elder if you were 40. So it was, it was a town of kids. Everyone was in their 20s and 30s. And now, you know, if you go to Provincetown, you're, you're kind of a kid or some say chicken if you're 55 and <laughs> on the early side of your 60s, which <laughs> lots, of, lots of very well-maintained people, but it's, you know, it's, a different, it's a different community. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to another section of the book. You sure. tell me. Um, let's see, there's a couple of short ones, but maybe, like this one's kind of sweet. It's called Unchartered, and yep. um, page, I think I see. Page 39. 39, right? Yep. Oh no, you know, I don't want to read, I want to read um, Husband. What page is that? I mean, that seems to, that's page 50, and that seems to flow a bit from okay. um, the first thing I wrote. Husband, after my first reading at the Fine Arts Work Center, I meet somebody I've been seeing a lot of in town. He has presence in his face, an alert and active expression. He's always looking, whether it's at the people or houses or at the harbor, at low tide, at the end of the street. His eyes are so bright, it looks like you can see all the way down into the clear, cold water of him. He is tall, a bit taller than I am, but not taller than Philippe, whom I rarely run into on the street anymore. He is relatively skinny, but carries himself in a way that suggests he wasn't always skinny. 
He knows what it's like to be thicker around the middle. He is a poet. His name is Mark. He speaks about my work like someone who knows his approval matters. And I am in awe, so grateful, my forehead moist with raised temperature. Beside him is a woman who echoes some of his body language. Though not like a wife or girlfriend, she walks with a cane, the stoop in the right shoulder. Has she been in an accident? She might be 68 or 38. Is that, is that why she has taken herself out of, in that way she has taken herself out of clock time. And it's no surprise to find out she is a poet too. Linda, black beaded dress, turban on her head, a cloche. Feathers, people dress up in town, but she dresses as if she's in the city, not New York, but Brighton or Prague in a basement piano bar where the people are too drunk to be jovial. Her outfit is in response to a world in which no one is looking, but we're looking. Some might say she is a female drag queen, but her style is more idiosyncratic and complicated than that, as she's not exactly making outsized statements about gender, nor appropriating another era and putting quotation marks around it. She is making something up about discarded things. She is constructing her vo own vocabulary of beauty. Her look wouldn't work for everyone, especially for someone who believes that fashion must be in dialogue with trends, but that's beside the point, which is that it's far from the standard she grew up with. That's my new husband. I say to my friends, we are walking down Pearl Street in the dark, trailing the two poets who are deep in conversation, walking close enough to be one person. I say it in a loud whisper, as if I half want to be heard by the people ahead of me and half want to make my friends laugh at the dog of me. It's the verbal equivalent of wagging my tail. I'm developing a character of myself by this point. I am someone in a comic French film or Buster Keaton, and it's a relief to slip into this other creature when I'm inarticulate and nervous, and humor is the only thing to make the awkwardness of life almost bearable. Plus, I'm a little giddy after having just given my reading. I think it went well. He already has a husband, my friend Polly says. Of course, he has a husband, I say, and the voice that comes out of my mouth is new to me. It isn't embittered or jaded. I'm happy for him. He glows. There is no question that someone like him, a human who looks at everything so he, he can correct, a human who looks at everything so he can transform it into description as a husband. Mm. I didn't know that that was prophetic then. I thought it was a, just a joke. I mean, it's so weird what your perceptions and your own writing can tell you. Yeah. yeah. It is so amazing to watch you actually discover some of the stuff as you're reading the stuff as well, too. So let me actually, let, let me talk a little bit about the community that you had at the Fine Arts Work Center. Just to let people know, when Paul was there, it's true to today, but for the pandemic, there were 10 artists and 10 writers. They were there for seven months. Um, and so, uh, Paul, you just mentioned Polly, and I'm looking over your left shoulder, and there's a silhouette over there. Might that, that be a piece of Polly Burnell's work? That was done by Polly Burnell for my 38th birthday. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, it was in a storage unit for some years because I moved a lot and I picked it up and retrieved it and I love its weirdness dearly. I have a number of polys around the apartment. Yeah. So, so you had 19 other fellows there um, and in the book you do talk about some of them specifically. Um, there's, a, there's a place in which you actually say them all by first names. Yeah. Um, but so what was that community like? What was it like being a fellow in 1991? Your stipend might have been what? $350, $400? It, it was no more than $375. It was in the, it was in the threes. And you got a, a $375 stipend and you got an apartment uh, and you were there for seven months in seven months. And what were the expectations? Um, the expectation, there were no, 
imposed expectations. I think the lovely thing about that experience is that many of the uh, people on the writing committee still lived in town and were part of the community. And they did, they made sure to draw us into community. They made sure to make us feel chosen. They invited us to their houses for dinner and um, came to all of our events. So, you know, we came into a place in which we weren't on our own, but, you know, we were taken in and it felt like we were, we were, people respected us in town. Like we were young and, and um, energetic and had ideas. And um, that felt really thrilling to me. Yeah. Um, I think it would have been a different experience if I'd been just, we'd just been cordoned off as a group on campus. And you know, what was also exciting at that time was that you know, the, there had been very few, you know, other than Michael Cunningham and a few other people, Michael Klein, there were very few queer fellows before the year that I got in. So it was a year in which you know, we had multiple queer fellows, we had a couple of black fellows, we had an indigenous fellow and it felt and we all like loved each other and got along and loved the fact that we were like a new, we were something new in part, you know, in part of the system of the place. And, you know, I think we all learned a lot from hanging out with each other. We had wonderful dance parties, um, always cooking for each other. And I think we felt challenged by each other's work and wanted to rise up and do the best work we could, first and foremost, to please each other. You know, it's funny, there's like a lot more writing in the book about my second year, because like the first year went so well, it felt utopian. It's not that there weren't problems in the atmosphere, but my memories of that place are of such deep love. I felt my adult self, my queer self, my, artistic self were all just bursting, you know? And I felt nourished and fed and really in love with my friends. I think many of us were really in love with each other in, you know, the most profound platonic ways. Yes, um, and, and, and my understanding is that, again, we're talking about 30 years ago, but you have maintained professional relationships and yeah. personal relationships with many of those people who you met 30 years ago. Yeah, they're, you know, they're first and foremost personal relationships. They were relationships based in community. I mean, I think the professional aspect is just kind of peripheral to how we know each other. But you know, I'm in touch with Elizabeth McCracken, who I went to grad school with, but we really got to know one another you know, during our fellowship. I'm in touch with her every day like multiple times a day. And she and her family, you know, her children, her husband are my, like one of my families. And um, yeah, so many, so many people, you know, from that time. I mean, I still see Andy Toll on the street in Provincetown and, you know, yeah, they're James Esper and Jim Fine. Um, who were both fellows at different years. I mean, Polly was a fellow. It was like Richard Baker, who was the visual coordinator. These people are super dear to me. And I wanted to write work that pleases them, that pleased them. You know, and that was... And so that became, and then also you talk about the fact that the writing committee was there in Provincetown at least part of the year. Who were some of the members of the writing committee that you remember being around? Yeah, good question. Well, there was like um, Bill Webb. Um, there was, um, you know, Roger Skillings, obviously. And I know there are others. I mean, I think Heidi John Schmidt was a part of it. But there were people like Alan Dugan, who, you know, who had won the Pulitzer Prize and Stanley Kunitz who might have sat in on those sessions, but they were so much in the air. I mean, Gail Mazur and Mike Mazur, and Gail the poet and Mike the painter were around. And, you know, there were others like Hattie Walker Fitz, who um, I don't believe was an artist herself, but 
definitely a part of you know the ancestry of alter of of artists in town and um yet we felt really enfolded into a wonderful life into um you know a history of a place we felt really special and it, you know that probably sounds a little syrupy but that was rare that was a rare experience and i think it helped us to be better artists we wanted to do not well for ourselves and our friends, but for the culture of the work center. Yeah, that's, that, that's an amazing observation of yours now 30 years later, and, and certainly times have changed. Let's go to another section of the book. Sure. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end. We have 10 minutes left. So do you have a meaty one you want to uh, read? Yeah, let's see. There's, like, there's another one. There's, this one's not called Three Way, but Three Ways. Let me just take a look at it. Sure. Um, I'm trying not to use much time. And you know, the other thing is, while, while, while Paul is looking this up, uh, I purposely kind of gave him suggestions about Provincetown, this experience in the Finance Work Center, and I've not really uh, pointed him toward any of the experiences about his family, particularly his mother, which is very plays a major role in this book. And so when you get the book, it's uh, those passages are incredibly beautiful. And then there are other writings that Paul has about his family. Again, I'd point you to Envoy that I talked about in the be beginning, but in, 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 in l later, um, Paul really has some wonderful things, some wonderful reflections about his relationships in, in those. So. For those of you thinking this is just about Provincetown and the Work Center, while it, it, while it does feel very much about that experience, there's also a lot of very personal experience that Paul has shared with us in this book. Thanks, Hunter. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. It's like multiple books in one. Somehow I was able to harness it to have a coherence. Um, so I think this one I'll read because I don't think I'd ever get to read this for a non-clear audience. It's called page? Taxonomy. Or tax so what page is that? 74. I might truncate it just a tiny bit. Okay. This taxonomy. There isn't a name for what Hollis and I for each other. Some could say we are friends. And the word friend is capri capricious. It's very, it's very sound is warm, inviting. It has the potential to contain many dimensions, and yet it feels like dissembling to introduce him as my friend Hollis, as if he's merely a workout partner, a study buddy. My anxiety over this matter might compel me to drop his name more than I had more if I had an actual category for him. Do I simply want to own him, or do I want to be owned by him? Neither of these options sound satisfactory without the other, but then again, I wonder if intimacy and attachment are even possible without the roof of a category. As much as I claim that categories are restrictive in every other realm, Hollis uses the term fuck buddy, but that seems simple, malnourished, as if we were just two teens getting together after soccer practice rather than two grown men in their early 30s. It diminishes, it builds tight walls, and it doesn't even give us any space for fondness and affection. Does Hollis think about his fuck buddy late into the night when he can't sleep? Does he grab him to his pillow with his arms or put it between his legs and think about how deeply he'd sleep if the fuck buddy were lying next to him, resting his head on his chest? The two of us are walking up Pearl Street toward the work center. These days, the sun goes down at four. Often you can feel the light starting to dim after two, which does not gladden my spirits, especially today. Another moody day. The sky never left darkness behind. My writing isn't going so well. That doesn't mean I'm not trying, just that I have only written a handful of scenes in months. They are possibly on the way to good scenes, but I can't seem to grow the novel before and after those scenes. I'm agitated into my deepest layers. Something about desire to be simply among, to be just another Provincetown queer 
isn't enough. It pales against what every human wants, purpose, recognition, contribution, attributes that could possibly have significance beyond the day we're in. For the first time in my life, I have been living for now, against futurity. But for, day, for today, at least, that isn't enough for me. I have been working on two novels at once. I have been working many years. I have to turn my back on all that now. Well, that would be crass. It would disrespect all the people who have read my work and pushed me and counted on me. And what if I'm not around in two, three years? I doubt that I'm dying, but it would be callow to be too certain. A sickly child, mononucleosis, mumps, chicken pox, speculations of leukemia and cystic fibrosis. I learned early on to be attuned to my body, to what hurt, to the parts that felt tired, achy. I do not think I'm sick. And though I could take the test, I'm apprehensive. Why be tested when the drugs they have are useless and damage the body? Is that the way to live longer, a better life? AZT, Bactrim, TDI, Retrovir, aerosol pentamidine, names out of a science fiction film that doesn't even evoke comfort, but have a violence in them, as if to remind us that the disease itself requires an ongoing vigilance, guns, bombs, and knives to keep a genocide at bay. But maybe the disease is stealthier than anyone's ability to outrun it. I will simply wake up one morning. I will reach over for my glasses on the night table, put them on, expecting the usual miracle of sight. I will not be able to see. I will try to blink, 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 the blink, 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 the darkness away. Stop there. Mm. An amazing, amazing piece. And uh, it so reflects what was going on there for you at that time. And also, not in, and that, of course, could have been written anywhere. Uh, but it was so much about Provincetown. Yeah, well, because we saw death. I mean, death was, wasn't a theory. It couldn't hide out in the way it could in, in say, New York City or San Francisco. But, yeah. you know, it was in the face of the person walking down the street or somebody you saw at the gym or the A&P. And... So uh, you've got a lot of greetings here from Belfast, Northern Ireland, from Northern California. Warning of people saying hello. Oh, hello, and, everyone. Uh, greetings from Germany. Uh, uh, somebody talking about it being a Philly thing. Uh, and so it's really nice to see so many people being here. And folks, remember, uh, we only have a few minutes left, but if you have questions for Paul, now's the time to sort of load them in and, uh, and we'll get to those questions at this point. Um, so Paul, so much of this book, um, is about the work center. And now we're 30 years later. Um, and the last year of the work center has taken a few bumps uh, mm -hmm. along the way. Um, there have been a few accusation, accusations leveled against it. And you not only are an alumnus in the sense that you were a fellow, but now you're, you're sort of on the inside because you're on the writing committee. Right, right. Uh, and so what do you think about all the stuff that you hear about the work center these days? Well, I can't speak from the position of the board. I can speak from a member of the writing committee and I'm just returning in my head back to that sense of welcome we felt when people from the community like carried and took care of us. And I think um, those of us, us on the writing committee have figured out over the last few years that like no one, none on the writing, no one on the writing committee lives in town anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have a group of fellows who are largely on their own and um, don't really know how they fit into what seems like this large granting institution. So, you know, early in, I don't want to say too much, early on the, in the, um, you know, during the fellowship year, there was, there were several incidents when neighbors abutting the work center called the police. And um, 
I think, and it was very traumatic for those fellows. I understand why they were, they were unsettled and upset. And, um, and, you know, I think those of us who are white and gay and lesbian, for us, Provincetown, and of a certain age, Provincetown is a welcoming place, like where we've come into our skin. And, you know, I think it's hard for us to see that that welcoming place is not, might not be welcoming to someone if you're a person of color who has not been to New England before. So imagine, you know, being a black person from another part of the country and your neighbor has called up the cops like seven times over the course of your first month in town. So, you know, I think, I think what on, we on the writing committee are going to do is just to be more actively involved in the fellows' lives. Some of us are gonna spend a week there. We're gonna act as mentors and make sure, um, make sure these people feel special and chosen and loved and respected and nurtured the way we were. We on the writing committee did not know that the experience of fellows in the current time was not what we experienced because it's this just happened over time in which you know people had people had died or moved on. So um, you know as painful as this experience has been, I really think you know, it was a reckoning that has helped many of us see what we, what we can do. How can we, how can we do our part to make people feel taken care of? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really good advice. I think we all need it. I think particularly those of us with white skins and those of us who are born male, uh, we, it's easy for us to put some of these things aside and not take them seriously. And so mm -hmm. I, I view it as a very positive thing. Uh, one yeah. last question uh, that I have for you is, um, so again, now 30 years, now you're, you're, you have, you know, however many books, you have a successful career that you're d doing. Um, so it's, this is kind of sort of a, a, a general qu question, but, for those who are interested in deciding about residencies, not just Provincetown, but any of them. I mean, what's interesting is that when Province, when the Fine Arts Work Center was founded um, in 1968, I think there were 12 residency programs in the United States. There was Yaddo, there was McDowell, Virginia. Um, there were, uh, uh, um, what's the one in upstate New York? Uh, oh, Blue uh, Mountain? Yes. Um, and, but now they're probably two or 300, which I think is great. But, but just give us some future for young artists and writers and their participation in residency programs going forward. Mm -hmm. They were super important to me as a young writer. I, you know, even before I went to get my MFA, I had gone to, three colonies and for me it was just I needed the experience of being around other artists not just um, artists of the written word but visual artists and I needed to sit around the table and expand my sphere outside of my local community so um, I worked tremendously well in some of those places and weirdly terribly in some others. And, um, you know, some of that might have been timing. Some of that might have been, I didn't like, I didn't like being in that particular place in upstate New York at that time in my life where the person next door was noisy. But I got, I mean, many of my books from, like, a lot of Long Boy was written at Ragdale. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of late, a good portion of portion of later was written at Yaddo and um, as a returning resident at the Fine Arts Work Center. So they continue to be important to me. And um, but you know nothing is quite like Provincetown 
There might be a few exceptions, but you know, Provincetown is the one with a community where you're there for seven months. Your life changes in that time. Um, because you're in a, an unusual place. You're in a place with a really powerful landscape. And I was just talking to my friend Polly tonight. And for her, um, she felt challenged to do a kind of painting that was different from anything she'd done before. She felt like, you know, she wanted to do work and her colleagues were doing work that was sort of rejected what was accepted and extolled in the art world at that time. And that was tremendously thrilling. So yeah, I think, I, I think amazing things can happen if you land up in the right place at the right time. It can feed your work tremendously. Um, you know, and honestly, you know, there are people like, I've met Sigrid Nunez, believe it or not, in 1988. I was a child, not really a child, but a child emotionally at the McDowell Colony before she published any of her books. And, you know, we've been on the periphery of each other's lives for decades, but, um, you know, those people stay around with you. And, you know, one of the real joys of being a writer is not just making work or getting to meet audiences, but to be close to your you know, close to your fellow workers and to see how their work changes and grows and challenges us over time. So there's, I, I have the deepest appreciation for any, for any program that makes this offering available to artists. Yeah, no, that's really well said, and thank you so much for saying that. And I, I, I only say thank you to the extent that what it does is it helps, it helps embolden those that that run these programs, but also helps um, embolden those who want to apply for them. And yeah. So, great. so uh, our hour has come to an end. Uh, I'm actually three minutes over, and so sorry about that. I want to give a big shout out to to uh, Emery Grant. Emery, show yourself here. Emery is the deputy director. Hello, Emery, nice to see you. He is the maestro behind all of this, and so he makes all this stuff happen. Um, and uh, so, this, um, so this has all been recorded. It'll be up on our website. We'll send it out in our newsletter. If you don't get our newsletter, uh, go to stonewall-museum.org. I suspect we've already added you to our newsletter. Don't fret, we're not asking for money. You can unsubscribe whenever you, you want. Um, but, um, but continue to read good queer books out there, uh, continue to find about queer experiences out there, continue to send your papers and your, and your articles and your things to local archives uh, throughout the you know, local gay and queer archives around the United States. It's very important uh, for all of our history to be recorded in that way. Um, and if you're, you're ever in South Florida, come visit us here. We're located in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the library has 28,000 volumes in it, including some of Paul's works. And, and this, this uh, one I'm going to donate. Although, Paul, I may send it back to you and ask you to sign it. Oh, um, I'd be happy to. And then you'll go into the special collection with the signed editions there. Um, and also, uh, we have two exhibitions up right now. We have one called BLK. Uh, which is a, um, a, a magazine that ran from 1988 to 1994, exclusively for the black and um, the black gay and le lesbian community in the United States. And so amazing thing coming out there. You can see a virtual tour and the contents of the exhibition on our website. And then next week, we're opening another exhibition uh, called First Look, which um, it's my first uh, look of showing interesting things that I've seen in the archives, which has been a real pleasure to be given that show. And you can see other virtual exhibitions about 20 years of pride or, or 50 years of pride. Uh, we just put up a great one about Tom of Finland's 100th anniversary. And so those are all again on our website. So see you all next week. Thank you everybody. Paul, thank you. It was great thank to you, see you. You too. Oh. Come down and see us here in Pompano Beach. So. I would love that. Yeah. Send love to everyone and yeah. anyone who is Thank here. Thank you all. Adios. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.